Hello. Well, I'm delighted to be here, uh, particularly because it's such a fascinating intersection of subjects and such a fascinating combination of speakers that we're going to hear. There is that great quote from Gandhi that the greatness of a nation and its moral progress are judged by the way its animals are treated. Well, you could substitute the words greatness and progress for survival, and uh, the definition of animals clearly as far as this afternoon is concerned is that animals, it's not humans and animals, it's humans as part of animals. And in line with the ambitions of today, this session is going to seek to shift perspectives, to get a clearer view, maybe to map a way through. And that means sometimes abandoning traditional, often disastrous points of view, ones that have taken us to where we are, for unfamiliar and uncomfortable insights. So the panel that's been assembled, as I say, they're going to put forward to the, in the next hour and a half or so some startling ideas, observations, and experiences indeed. But there's an underpinning of reason and science to all of that. It's an impressive mix of academic, uh, academics, academe, and practice. So you'll be hearing from Professor Jenny C. Stevens, Professor of Sustainability Science and Policy at Northeastern University. I'm not going to give lengthy biogs because I know you can all click through on those links you've already got. From W.K. Luna, who hereafter will be referred to as Nell, who is the artist and PhD candidate. Robin Maynard, Director of Population Matters, and Dr. Emily Doolittle, composer and lead in art making in the Anthropocene at the Royal Conservatoire of Scotland. The way it's going to work is this. Uh, everybody will speak for roughly 10 minutes. If there is something that you would like clarified specifically about that presentation, there'll be a couple of minutes after they have spoken just to do that. But we want to keep the momentum going so that actually the real discussion happens after all four presentations and can involve everybody. So if you would kind of hold back your big thoughts, if possible. Um, but obviously, please do uh, feel free to question. I'll be up here to, to handle that, to question the speakers immediately after they do speak. So let us start. I have to say that I um, started my research during the time of COVID and Zoom and all my presentations were made online to a bunch of switched off screens. So this is my first time with proper live people. So I'm a bit nervous, so please bear with me. I have not done this before ever in a, in, in a, in a room full of people. So um, I'm also a bit blown away by Jenny. We had a Zoom meeting, the, the panel, last week, and Jenny was really quiet. And not knowing her, I thought, gosh, she's, she's quite a quiet person. Well, she, turns out she isn't at all. She's incredibly powerful and um, so a hard act to follow. So uh, let me go through the traditional niceties, which I've been um, told to observe um, when you start doing uh, presentations, which is to thank people for allowing you to be here. So in my case, I'd like to thank UL Research, Oriana, Pratap, Lynn, particularly uh, David and Barr for allowing me to address you today. I'm very pleased and grateful to be here. And I'm going to start by putting you off because I want to tell you that my research, Jenny was talking about power systems, my research concerns religious imagery, which is enough to put most people off because most people aren't interested in religion. But let me start by, let me, bear with me, by let me explain to you that it's a secular approach and I'm interested in the power of, of these images and the power that religion holds. It's, it's, it's um, uh, not more religious than that. Um, the film clip I'm going to be showing you at the end is rough and imperfect, so it's a work in progress. I haven't finished my, um, my, uh, my uh, 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 PhD yet. It's a film that I've put together, and it will take contributors uh, and collaborators much more expert than me in their fields of expertise, which is um, in, in, in uh, music and filmmaking, to produce the finished result, which I think this project deserves. Uh, the paintings I'm going to show you that are um, coming up are currently on display at the Zabludovich collection altogether. But, I mean, the paintings all together. And the Zabludovich collection, for those of you who don't know, is a, 
um, privately owned, publicly accessed museum in North London. And um, they're also on, I'm pleased to say, on the current John Moore's Painting Prize shortlist. I'd also like to point out that research in my particular area has never been done before, to the best of my knowledge. Normally when you go and do a PhD, you have to make it narrower and narrower and narrower to find something that hasn't been looked at. But I can't, and my uh, supervisors haven't been able to find anything at all about this, which is rather amazing. So there is nothing that I can find, to the best of my knowledge. And furthermore, as you'd expect of anybody doing research, the connections I'm making are entirely new. So I want to offer you an opinion on one thing. The animal in the image of the Lamb of God and the animal in the image of the Virgin Mary are ignored for a reason. And that reason is connected with the devastation of the earth currently. And let me tell you how I came to believe this. Firstly, the Lamb of God, up there. It's everywhere and nowhere. Florence, for example, where this is photographed, is a city awash with a lamb. It's a center of the Renaissance wool trade and evident on every other street corner and every other building. It's, an, it's put up as an embellishment, but it's hardly noticed. And when you begin to notice that you're not noticing it, you notice that it's on menus, pub signs, football shirts. It's, it's on everywhere. It's everywhere and nowhere. It hides in plain sight. And I wondered why. And the, a, a tiny history of it is it was funded first by the church, as you can imagine, uh, all the decoration around it, then by guilds and merchants through the wealth of wool. Uh, he used its connection with God as a powerful association. And then it became even more loaded with propaganda and political bias when it was given the national flag of whatever country it happened to be ending up in over its shoulder. That's a very common, as you can see over there, they call it a pennant. Coming back to our earlier question about animals, the lamb is a sheep, and sheep are everywhere. But sheep aren't just sheep, they are ewes. How often do you see a field of sheep and see family groups? Agriculture just isn't like that. Now to the second image, the Virgin Mary. It's another promulgated by the church. The wealth of the church required her, for many reasons, to be exactly what her image shows us. Not in my image, but in the classic image. An animal, passive, docile, submissive. Despite being Jesus' only human parent, according to her story, she's barely human. She never processes through the normal functions of sex, menstruation, aging, or death. And importantly, and shockingly, she speaks four times in the Bible, only four times. So these two images, the lamb and the woman who is Mary, are connected by more than just being two-dimensional and unrealistic of the actual animal to which they refer. They also, crucially, share this. The modern sheep is, like Mary, remotely impregnated. The only subject of her intimacy is with her child, which she loses. In the case of the modern sheep, relentlessly. And they share another connection. They both occupy a place in church music. The Agnus Dei, the Lamb of God in Latin, is part of every cathedral daily sung mass, Catholic and Anglican, and the Stabat Mater, which means standing mother in Latin, the Stabat Mater is a hymn for the Virgin Mary, where she weeps at the foot of the cross at the loss of her son, a music sound version of the Pieta. Even if you're not religious, you will recognize this complex web of culture, inherited power systems, and species exceptionalism of which we are a part together with its canonical images and music that's been handed down through millennia, through innumerable generations, and occupy our peripheral consciousness from birth to death. 
I'd also like to ask you to allow me to move you to something else unnoticed across the world, something that happens specifically where sheep are farmed. The following is from the poet Ted Hughes, um, a Yorkshireman, the only other person I know who's not noticed this particular occurrence. I'm sure other people have, but I haven't come across any writing about it. He wrote, Long ago, when searching for music on the radio, I came across the most appalling, harrowing sound, a wide vista of horrible suffering. Distorted by static, it sounded like one of the circles of Dante's hell. The Swedish or Danish commentary did nothing to enlighten me, and years later, on a Welsh moor, I heard the sound again. Since then, I've heard it many times, and the last time I heard it, I wrote it down. What he's talking about is this. When ewes are sheared and they return to their lambs, the lambs can't recognize their mothers amongst the other shorn mothers. And the mothers can't recognize their lambs because of the panic of the, of the large group. They not only look different, they smell different. They not only long for each other or love each other, they need each other to survive. And this is particularly acute when, on occasions in early uh, shearing, when lambs are not yet on grass, so they are still what the lamb, the farmer calls on the suck. So the atavistic connection between mother and child is even more acute. Every parent, and I challenge every parent in this audience, who knows that feeling when they temporarily lose their child in public. Suddenly, you go into a vocal shouting creature without pausing to think. This occurs for sheep, yearly at least, on every farm where sheep are kept for the 11,000 years we've kept sheep. And Hughes goes on to say that the, the anguish for these goes on and on for about four to five hours, depending on the size of the group, um, the, 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 the reconciliation of finding each other and calming down. This is not an animal rights issue. Certainly the animals that I've been dealing with on the farm I've been working on are very well-treated animals. But it's important to notice that this otherwise quite docile, quiet animal even, suddenly becomes a raging one. And again, the connection here with Mary is like her at the foot of the cross, at the very moment of her trauma, in fact, at the very moment where she arguably ceases to become a mother at all, she's effaced as a mother, moves her to being savagely vocal, like the ewes. The only time, in fact, she is savagely vocal. We are all animals. We are first animals. The pandemic showed us it is what connects us, actually. We ignore our animal connections at our peril yet ignore them we do at ever greater speed. Women required to be mute, passive, and biddable means no education, menstruation's taboo, human rights are ignored. Consider this. 96% of the mass of mammals on our planet today are us and the livestock we've domesticated. 96%. The sheep on the planet are currently almost 1.3 billion. They're required to be processed endlessly, even in the best circumstances, to meet our 21st century needs. This means relentless mothering, as well as relentless loss, as well as our impact on the environment. The effect on our growing population and our consumption now directly threaten our own future. My project, will set a film to this common farm scene that I've described using a specially composed soundtrack, using that very, very animal sound, which I've now recorded three times, from that Ted Hughes refers to, combined with a special piece of music to form an anthem called Lament. And I propose for it to sit in the musical canon, if you like, temporarily, admittedly, between the Agnes Day, the piece of music that gets sung in cathedrals up and down the world every day, and the Stabat Mater. It'll be inserted between the two, giving voice to the animal that is Mary and the mother that's the you, to make this moment for both explicit. 
and I hope it can join the chorus of those around the world currently clamoring to be heard. So I'm going to show you the film that I've thrown together. I'm not a filmmaker, I'm a painter, but um, I, uh, I'm going to show you the film um, I'm going to make, uh, making here. Just a bit of background. The, um, there's Ted Hughes speaking at the beginning, and uh, that's part, small part of his poem. And at the end is the composer I've been working with. It's a piece of his contemporary Stabat Mater. Our piece of music will be different, but I've, I've put a bit of his Stabat Mater, and we're working with an astonishing countertenor called Andreas Scholl, who some of you may know. Uh, because I might... Can you play the film? The mothers have come back from the shearing, and behind the hedge, the woe of sheep is like a battlefield in the evening, when the fighting is over, and the cold begins, and the dew falls, and bowed women move with water. Mother, 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 the lambs are crying, and the mothers are crying. Nothing can resist that probe, that cry of a lamb for its mother, or a news crying for its lamb. The lambs cannot find their mothers among those shorn strangers. I am not religious. I'm not an environmentalist. I'm not an animal rights campaigner. I'm not a scientist. I'm not even a vegetarian. I don't know the statistics like others on my panel will, and earlier panels. I'm an artist. And art is an instrument of war. Statistics are one thing, but art can move people to care. Art makes the particular universal in the way other things can't. It's what artists do, and it's what art research does particularly well. As we've heard others say, sustainability isn't a choice. It's a fact. We're all in this together, but we can make ourselves worthy of our times. We differ, and those differences matter. This project seeks to ground the materially grounded differential. I passionately believe that we need to find a position that doesn't vilify the male, the European, the human, but instead to activate multiple ways of constructing transdisciplinary community, moving towards a rhizomic, relational, collaborative, ontological subject, a place where different voices can be heard. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you, Nell. Um, magnificent. So, any, any immediate questions now? People are still oh, good. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> the two, in fact, are diagonally from Hi, uh, that was amazing. Thank you, Nolan. Uh, somebody mentioned Levinas earlier and the ethical recognition of the human face. And I think I'm right in saying that Levinas denied that animals could have the same effect on you. The human face was very particular, he said, and caused you to, it, it gave you an ethical imperative. Now, it strikes me that what you've done is to work against that and say the cry works exactly, and you made the analogy, as it would if you lost your child. So, thank you. I'm behind, further, just behind. Thank you. Thanks, Nell, that was brilliant. Thank you. I think what is unifying the conversation so far today for me is this idea of storytelling. And it's making me think about Abhidash Ghosh and what he was talking about with colonialization and about removing stories. As I'm a sorry, way. I didn't hear the name. What was the name? Abhidash Ghosh. Um, that makes curse. Um, if you take the story away from the land, you have a right to exploit it. And that's what the colonials did. And by doing that, everything was extracted. And I think you're playing around with these ideas that, that are very, very powerful. Oh, good. Thank you. Excellent. Right. Well, Mill, thank you very much for now. Uh,